companies can set up their capital structure and within the capital structure will be all the primary sources of capital available to a firm. Then I'll show you how to determine the cost of long-term debt and how it's the after-tax cost of this debt is relevant to the cost of capital. We're going to look at calculating the cost of preferred stock as well as calculating the cost of company common shares of stock, retained earnings, and the issuance of new common stock. And finally, I'll walk you through the WAC, or Weighted Average Cost of Capital. Okay, <clears throat> so let's give you a quick overview of the cost of capital. So companies, remember that capital is just another word for money. So companies need to raise money in order to fund investments. And, well, not just investments, just the overall growth of the company, company expenditures. So companies typically don't have enough money or capital to do it by themselves. So they need to raise additional capital. So they can have many sources of funds to where they can pull from to raise a pool of capital. So in this chapter, we're gonna look at, you know, the cost of a company's financing and the structure of the company's financing, which we call the cost of capital. So each different source of capital have its own rate. So a project that we're thinking about uh, including in the company or moving forward with, we wanna make sure that that project is gonna have a return larger than the cost of the capital used to fund the project. So that's the basic concept. Now capital is going to be any long-term source of financing for a company. And that could be either in the debt or equity areas. So the debt areas are really borrowing money at an interest rate. And that can be done through um, corporate bonds or even borrowing from a bank. Now, Equity refers to stock issuing, and that can be done in a few different ways, issuing new stock. Um, but we also want to look at, when we talk about equity or cost equity, we also want to think about the retained earnings because that's part of the equity. That's money that the company earns but keeps to reinvest. And the current cost of the existing equity. So the capital structure is just going to be a mix of this debt and equity that a firm is going to utilize to move the company forward. So the weighted average cost of capital is um, looking at the size of each portion of funding and then calculating the weight of that funding to, to ultimately get a weighted average of the interest rate for all the different sources of funding. So that way we know what our, our hurdle rate is. We know what the the amount of return we must exceed to make sure the company is profitable. So basically, if our weight average cost of capital is 5%, we wouldn't invest in any investment or project that's going to return less than 5% because that would ultimately lose the company money. Think of, we can do an example of uh, cost of capital, which I'm going to let me pull up Excel here to do a quick example. So we'll do a little bit of personal Maybe you want to figure out what's the weighted average cost of capital for going to school. So you may have money that you earned at a job that you have saved. So for a company, we would call that uh, retained earnings, which I'm just abbreviate to RE. So you may have money that you could utilize. So this would be called the source uh, amount rate. Let's see, we'll do a per, per, amount percentage. And then rate. Make this a little bit bigger for you. Okay. Okay. So you have your retained earnings, which is, this would be what be some money that you may have saved from working. Then you would most likely have a loan, but you might actually have a few loans. 
and then you could have we'll just leave it like that okay so maybe you saved thousand dollars and then you're taking out loans for various amounts okay so our total So if we sum this to get a quick total, I'll just use the sum function here. So this would be the total of money for format this into currency, maybe for a semester. So the amount, percentage amount, or weight, so the weight of each loan or amount of capital source so we take the amount of the source and divide by the total this would give us a weight now if i put an absolute i'm just going to put an absolute signs on the total here to lock down basically what i'm doing is i'm locking down this cell here So you can see the sum, if I was to move this formula over, sum is 100%. So this is, so my biggest source thing is loan four, which is 32% of my total. Now, so if I have a rate, so maybe the save money, the save money, we could put a rate on that and we might just put the real cost of this money is inflation. So we'll put a rate of inflation on that because you're not really paying money to a bank for that, but you are gonna lose out to, uh, let's say an opportunity cost. So you could think of this too, as like I could either use this to put into my education or maybe the opportunity cost is I had a, uh, a bond that pays 5%, I would normally put the money into, so that would be the cost of that capital. So instead of investing, this, you're losing that 5%, so that would be the cost of using any retained earnings or save money. For the different loans, we can put in different percentages here. Okay. So here are the different percents. Uh, so in order to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, we would take the amount of the weight and multiply it by the rate. And then, let's open this up a bit. Then we'd find the sum, and this would be the weighted average cost of capital, which is the sum. It's not the same as the average. So here you can see the average is 6.2 because this is a weighted average, so it's taking in the proportional amount. Uh, so the 4,000 is being a bigger influence than the 1,000. So this would be what we're trying to calculate here, which is the weighted average cost of capital. So this means that uh, in total, this is what my the rate on the source of funds is gonna be. So for a company, if that the weighted average cost of capital was 6.64%, then whatever investments they make would have to have a return greater than the 6.64%. Now for you, the return on investment for going to university um, is going to be maybe somewhere over a million dollars of additional income earned because you have a college degree. So that far outstrips the cost of the capital to go to school and that's why students continue to pay the money to go to college because the return on your investment to go to college is much higher than the cost. Okay. So that's the basic concept behind the weight average cost of capital. Now, now moving forward, capital structures of a couple of example companies here. Alphabet is what is really Google. So you can see here the list, their debt percentage or percentage of the company's value is debt and then equity. So you can see that Google is mostly stock equity, very little debt. When you get to General Motors, they have 53% debt, 
compared to 47% equity. So that's sort of their capital structure is almost, <clears throat> I guess GE would be the closest at a 50, closest to 50, 50, 51 to 49%. Um, I mean, closest to having even equity to debt. But there's just some examples of some companies' capital structure. So let's talk more about sources of long-term capital. So long-term capital would be in this area of the assets. Your long-term debt, these are sources. So you can use long-term debt as a source of long-term capital. Or you can also use uh, preferred stock, common stock, uh, and retained earnings. So these are areas where a company can generate sources of capital, which we would consider in a long-term basis. <clears throat> so not all companies are gonna use all these categories at once, but a combination of such. So, so for some companies that are very profitable and make a lot of earnings, they all they might need is additional retained earnings to fund their projects. They may not need to call on the capital markets to issue bonds or new stock or preferred stock to raise capital. So for the cost of long-term debt, what we look at here is what the rate is gonna be associated with raising new funds. So this is something that's going to be a combination of the company's risk, risk characteristics as well as the, uh, the current rate in the market. But we could calculate the cost of long-term debt given various inputs. Now, one thing that we want to look at is the net proceeds. So this is the, the actual money the firm is going to receive after the sale of security because there are fees and commissions, uh, which we call, um, which are going to be subtracted from this gross proceeds to get the net proceeds. So the flotation costs are the cost of actually issuing these new securities or these new bonds. And like I said, these flotation costs are usually charged by an investment bank um, who is going to organize the sale of the new bond. So even though it, you know, the bond, they might be issuing a million bonds at $1,000 a piece, um, they're not actually going to receive that full amount. There's a charge, um, as there is with most, most things, for this, to, this capital to be issued to the markets and for the company to collect their money. So this flotation charge would be part of the calculations uh, as the cost of long-term debt. Now, the before tax cost of debt is something that corporations pay attention to. So this is similar to how mortgage interest can be deducted on a person's individual taxes. So if you have mortgage interest, you can deduct that on your taxes and lower your overall mortgage rate, which makes the, the mortgage interest um, actually less because you get a tax refund. It's the same thing for companies. So companies will, will um, look at the yield, but they'll also factor in what's the yield after the, the tax reduction. So we, we're gonna have, first thing we need to calculate is the before tax cost of debt. So this is just gonna be the, the rate of interest that is on the bond. So it's simply the rate of interest the firm has to pay for the borrowing. Now, the market is, you know, gonna, is gonna be a big influence in setting these rates, but we can utilize things that we learned in the previous chapter um, to calculate the yield to maturity, to kind of see where bonds of similar risk are lying, and that will give us an idea of what the market rate for our cost of debt will be. So we could simply use the, um, yield to maturity to calculate the before tax cost of the bond, which we're familiar with from the previous chapter uh, on bonds. Now we're gonna use a spreadsheet, of course, as we always do, to calculate. So for this example, this will be shown uh, in the spreadsheet later in class. And this is just an example of how we're gonna calculate uh, a rate of a bond. Okay, so there's also something called the approximating approximating the cost. So this is a different way of calculating 
the before tax cost of debt. Now, so the approximating the cost formula, as shown here, is an actual formula you can use. We don't really use, there's no Excel function for this, so you would do this in the calculator. Then we can still use the calculating properties of Excel to calculate it, but this is not going to be identical to Excel's yield to maturity calculation, which is exact. So this is an approximation. So if you see a homework or test problem which asks you to use the approximating the costs to calculate the, co the before cost of the debt, you need to use this formula because it will be different than what's the, the um, exact cost of debt. So this approximation formula was used before spreadsheets. And it's just a tool to quickly uh, calculate a pretty close number to what the exact is. But remember, it's a different formula than what we're doing in the spreadsheets. Okay, so here's an example of using the approximate value. Uh, and again, you know, we're just going to plug in the variables. So these particular variables, whether it, this is the bond here, of course, the cost of the bond, but we have the interest rates, the net proceeds, the number of years, the bond's maturity. So when we input this information, we get an approximately what the before tax cost of debt is. And again, <clears throat> this is going to be different. It's not going to be as precise as a calculator or I just say as a financial calculator or using a financial formula in the spreadsheet because it's it's simplified a bit so you're missing some of the more complex calculations to give you the exact answer now getting back to what i was talking about earlier the after tax cost of debt so it's important that we calculate the before because we can't calculate the after tax cost of debt until we calculate the before tax cost of debt so once we have that before tax cost of debt we need to multiply it, um, we need to influence it by the tax rate. Now, we, the reason we do this is, as I explained before, that bondholders don't have to, the tax is, they have a tax deduction, so they don't have to pay tax on the interest. So interest, whatever the total interest dollar amount is for the year, they can deduct that from their taxes. So that means the actual rate is going to be lower. So in 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act actually lowered the marginal tax rate from a high level of 35% to a flat tax of 21%. So let's see. So we'll calculate this in the spreadsheet. And I'll show you how this is calculated later in, uh, in this video or possibly a second video. It's a pretty easy calculation. Let's move on to cost of preferred stock. So here we're looking at preferred stock, which is a different classification of stock that we learned about in chapter seven, the stock equity chapter. So preferred stock is a hybrid financial vehicle. So it has the properties of both bonds and stock. So the property it is shares of stock that are issued, but these shares are preferred because they come with a guaranteed dividend. Now, what makes preferred stock better than debt is that it never has to be paid back, but the dividend <clears throat> will always be something that has to be paid. So where bonds would have a fixed life of say 10 or 30 years, preferred stock is continuous. It doesn't have an end date unless the company repurchase it. So the cost of preferred stock is simply going to be the annual dividends divided by the net proceeds from the sale of the stock. So, or it could be the, the dividends per share divided by the per, the per share price. But here we're going to go with the annual, total annual dividend divided by the net proceeds of the sale of the stock. Then this would tell us the cost of this preferred stock. Now, a little bit more complex of an area, it would be the uh, cost of common stock. So this would be, you know, stock is issued, but it doesn't have to be paid back because it is, is going to be continuous life. So when stock is issued, the company is going to generate funds and the stock is going to transfer ownership. So a company may sell 10% of the company as stock and that ownership goes to the investors. Now the investors aren't guaranteed a dividend, 
but they, are, they get capital gains as the stock price increases. So the concept here is issue equity, take the equity, expand the business, generate more profits and reward the shareholders with a higher stock price or possibly um, dividends. So the cost associated with, any cost associated with common stock equity financing is gonna help us determine the cost of the common stock. So we wanna look at the return of the firm's uh, common stock without the flotation car charges. So the cost of the common stock is the same as the cost of retained earnings. So if we don't include any of the flotation charges, then the cost of the common stock is what we use as the cost of retained earnings. Because retained earnings are also funds, but these are funds that the company raised, but they should have the same cost of capital as the common equity. Now, if we issue new shares of stock, and this is something a company can do, they can do an IPO and issue an initial batch of stock, and then later on, because usually when companies do an IPO, they're not selling 100% of the company. They're selling 10, 15, 20% of the company. So they're able later on to sell additional shares of new stock, uh, which represents additional ownership in the company. But these are going to have flotation charges, so they're going to be at a higher rate. Now, to calculate the cost of common stock, we're going to again pull from Chapter 7 and use the Gordon model. So here, we can calculate the price. The Gordon model will calculate the price of a stock by dividing the dividend divided by the um, required rate of return on the stock minus the growth rate. So this is one model for finding the cost of common equity. And if we, if we use algebra to set the, the variables, we could um, move the required rate of return over to the left side of the equation. So then we would get the dividend divided by the stock price plus the growth rate of the dividend would give us the cost of equity. And this is, of course, for a constant growth valuation model, which we learned in Chapter 7. And this model is really not used too often to calculate the cost of equity because very few companies pay a constantly growing dividend anymore. But this is just an example of one model that can be used and certainly will be used in the homework or the test. So it's important to know. Now, more realistically, what most companies will utilize in calculating the cost of common equity would be the capital asset pricing model. So the capital asset pricing model is going to um, work for companies without dividends. So it's a relationship between required return and a non-diversifiable risk. These are also concepts covered in previous chapters. Now, so the risk of the firm can be measured by the beta coefficient, which we also covered, I think, in chapter seven. So here is the beta coefficient represented by this B. So what this means is this stock's individual volatility in relationship to the market's volatility. So we create this coefficient to see the higher this coefficient, the more volatile the stock is in relative terms compared to the market. So what we want to do is inside, so this R to the M is the market risk. We want to subtract from that the risk-free rate, which is usually a treasury bill. So we don't want to amplify the risk-free rate, so we subtract it from the market rate. And the rate that's left over, we amplify by beta. So say beta here was 2, the market return was 10, and the risk-free rate was 2. So if we take the risk rate from the market return, we're left with uh, 8%. If we multiply that by beta of 2, we get 16%. Then we add back the 2% of the risk-free rate because we didn't want that amplified, but we still want that in the required rate. So that 16 becomes, add 2 to that, we get 18, and that's our required rate of return. So you see here, we just magnify, use beta to magnify the market risks, but not the risk-free rate. And then this will give us what's the required rate of return from the stock based on the volatility of beta. And this is what more commonly is used for most companies because most companies don't pay a constantly growing dividend. So this capital asset pricing model would be the best substitution. So finding the cost of stock equity. Well, one, um, using the capital asset pricing model, we could calculate the expected return required rate of return for a stock. But you'd have to look up 
you know, a three-year treasury to have the risk-free rate. And you could use, um, you could look up the beta for that stock if it's publicly traded stock. And then uh, the market return is something that you would expect from a market portfolio of assets. So if the company was an S&P 500 company, you would look at the market return for the S&P 500. Okay. So the cost of common equity. So if we're comparing the constant growth and the capital asset pri um, pricing model techniques, we know that the capital asset pricing model differs um, as we've seen in the previous slide because it directly considers the risks of the firm as affected by beta. So and if you want to determine the required return on a common stock equity using the CAPM, beta is the critical input. Now the constant growth model is not really looking at risk directly. It's using um, an indirect approach, which is going to be what investors are, you know, willing to pay for the stock today, given what they know about the company's future dividends. So those are just two really different ways or aspects to value the required rate of return of a company or the cost of the company's equity. Both are valid, <clears throat> but I guess you would use the model you would use would be based on the stock, different stocks, actual um, dimensions or influences of risk in their actual, you know, what characteristics the stock has to make it more representative of one of the two categories. So to put it really simply, if the stock pays no dividends or plays a, pays a flat dividend, you'd probably use the capital asset pricing model. And if the stock is using a constant growth payment for its dividend, you'd use the constant growth model. Okay. Now, when we're looking at the cost of common equity, there are flotation charges that have to be uh, acknowledged. So, so flotation charges, so this would really be the cost of new equity is where the flotation charges come into an account. Now, so if we're issuing new shares of stock, we're going to have to pay the investment bank a significant amount of flotation charges, which is going to increase the cost of equity. So here we would divide the dividend using the Gordon model, the dividend by the N to the end, which this would represent the net price of the new cost of equity plus G. Okay. Which we'll see that calculated in Excel a little bit later. Now the cost to retain earnings, no calculation is needed here because you calculate the cost of common stock, the cost of the stock is going to equal the cost of retained earnings. So there the same percentage. So there really is no cost of retained earnings because you use the cost of stock equity. Okay. So in, in the world today, companies do prefer uh, to use retained earnings. So that's the preferred source of financing because generally it's the easiest to access. And this is the only difficult it, difficulty here is does your company generate enough retained earnings to fund all the projects? Now, the first place you would go to is your retained earnings to fund the project, and you would only hit the capital markets if you ran out of retained earnings and you had projects that were pretty valuable moving forward. And that's because retained earnings is, is the quickest, easiest, and usually one of the lower costs of the company as far as funding a project. Now, if we look at the world, the United States, you know, and most of the companies are going to rely heavily on the retained earnings as a source. But in other countries, um, their primary sources of funds would be bank loans. So if you think the, the U.S. has pretty readable, uh, reliable and uh, access to capital markets to issue, issue equity. Um, and they have... Many of the companies, countries may not have that same ability to quickly issue new equity or existing equity. So 
the retained earnings <clears throat> is a lot quicker source of funding because it could take the lead up to issuing new equity um, or could be months. So that's why retained earnings is definitely number one. And then secondarily, bank loans. Uh, provide a, a Bank loans would be quicker than issuing corporate debt or bonds. So usually bank loans is the second choice of primary funds for most companies. Or, um, and that's why a lot of companies will have a, um, a line of credit with a bank already established. So this line of credit would mean that they could access funds at the bank uh, within minutes or hours. Uh, so they pre-negotiate and they pre-set up a credit line at the bank. So that way the bank loans are already are established. They just have to access them. It's sort of like having a credit card where you already have the ability to borrow $10,000 in your credit card. So whenever you want to spend it, it's there to spend. You don't have to apply for a new card. So let's move into the actual calculations of the weighted average cost of capital. So here's the formula. I think that when I calculate this in Excel, in the next video, you'll see how it's a lot easier uh, when you're utilizing Excel. But the basic formula is we take the weight of each area times the rate. So the weight times the rate for debt minus the multiplied by one minus the tax rate, plus the weight of the preferred stock times the rate of the preferred stock plus the weight of stock times the rate of the stock, we get a weighted average cost of capital. Kind of like what I showed you in the personal example of financing your college. So again, this formula looks long and complex, but it's actually pretty easier, and it's a lot easier done in Excel, which we'll see next. Okay, <clears throat> some important points here. The weights of each of the individual sources of capital have to equal one or 100%. Uh, and the weights are gonna be, again, based on the total market value the, you know, of the capital pool and the individual value for each capital source. So simply taking the individual capital source and dividing it by the total market value to get a percentage. And then multiplying that um, the firm's cost of stock equity by its re um, the required return. You know, so what I mean to say here, the weight of the common stock equity. So if common stock was 50% of the portfolio, of capital, then multiplying it by its required rate of return would be that percentage would be the contribution point of stocks to the overall cost in the weighted average cost of capital. All right. So if we look at this example here, we see that the weight uh, for long-term debt is 40%, preferred stock is 10%, and 50% of the portfolio is equity. If we have three different rates, these are all percents. Um, you can see that common stock is more expensive than long-term debt or preferred stock. So if we multiply this 40% by 4%, we get the, its portion or weighted portion of, of rate of 1.95%. Per preferred stock would contribute 0.83% and common stock would contribute 6.5%. So if you add these three percentages together, you get that 9.28%, and that's the weighted average cost of capital. So it's sort of... Um, like a uh, like a an, it's like your grade point average. It's just it's a weighted, but in this case the sources are not all equal. <clears throat> okay, so if we talk about capital structure, this is the how a company is going to put together their sources of capital, and they call that a capital structure. So companies can design a capital structure weight. In, in two ways. So they could do market value weights, which are weights that use market values to measure the portion of each type of capital in the firm's capital structure. So in calculating the weighted average cost of capital, the market weight should be used rather than book value. So that just basically, when we say, anytime we say market rates, what we're talking about here is the, the value in the current market. So if we're talking about stock, it's the current stock price. If we're talking about bonds, it's the current price of the bond in the market. When they say book value, we're talking about the book value per share of a stock, which is equity, which would be assets minus liabilities would be the equity divided by outstanding shares, or the par value of a bond, which is usually $1,000. So the market values 
means that we actually use the values associated to what the market is valuing those those assets at, those loans at, not what the book value is. Now, the targeted capital structure, this is going to be a mix of debt and equity. So the firm may desire that we, they could say we want our our mix to be 70% debt, 30% equity. So that would be our target. So the, the capital structure should re reflect this optimal mix that they have set up as far as a firm, th the debt to equity, they might set up 70% equity, 30% debt. And that's, so when they go out to borrow new funds, they're gonna look at maintaining that capital structure because they don't want it to be, uh, they don't want the capital structure to be unbalanced or in the position where they're not comfortable with. So they might set these targets up as to where they're gonna borrow money from and what loans they're gonna take. Okay, so this ends uh, part one in chapter nine. The second part uh, I'm gonna record separately and this is going to be the Excel demonstrations of the calculations for the chapter. So look for the next video where I'll talk about and I'll show you the calculations of all the formulas mentioned in this chapter. Thank you for your time and take care.